Deborah, with her 30 years of being an entrepreneur and creating over seven companies, knows exactly what it means to accept the mission. When you make that decision, when you accept the mission to become a solopreneur, to take yourself and your talents to market, then you embrace a life of not only unlimited possibilities, but also the unknown. It's an elixir of fear and bravery that only someone who's taken the leap really understands. On our show, Deb digs deep with her guests to highlight what you, the listener, wants to know. The stories, the whys, and the hows to navigate the journey to success. Get ready to hear from some of the most incredible mission takers from Generation Z to Boomers. So sit up, perk up, and get ready to be blown away. Now here is your host, Deborah Drummond. Mission accepted. Absolutely. I'm telling you, you guys, let me see. You know you're the best. What am I going to say about you today? You're the most riskiest. You are the most riskiest audience ever, ever. And you know what? Ironically, so is our guest. Man, this guy has done many things. And I'm going to share that with you. He is a multi entrepreneur. And you know, when I talk about entrepreneur, I mean, that's an entrepreneur that can't say no, in case you don't know. <laughs> it's an entrepreneur that, like David says, when one door opens, he hops through the window. Like if he can make it happen, he's going to make it happen. And you guys are here to listen to stories have a good little laugh on other people's accounts, on the bravery that they've had to go and venture and also to gain inspiration and motivation and honestly, dedication. That if you've got something inside that's making you say that I want to go forward and you need some oomph around that or you need to know you're not the only one in the circus, you came to the right place, baby. <laughs> so David, I want to you know recognize you and appreciate you because Everyone in my audience knows about this big stand up, show up and speak up. Yes, you 22 summits and a collaborative book of 262 women on fire out there doing the deal. And David has stepped up to be one of the sponsors to that whole project. So thank you so much. And not until this moment did I recognize how much how much respect you must have for authoring because in this conversation we had pre-show I mean I've been caught up in the book that he just recently released that I'm all inspired about because this guy's done some pretty cool stuff and that book was really inspiring to me and it's about health and health and fitness and all that which you guys know I'm a big proponent of um, because he had a personal journey and when you hear what he went through uh, in his personal journey of getting healthy right getting healthy and how he did it it's quite opposite to what you hear a lot out there about the different ways to get healthy. And um, he did a little trek. I'll just say he did a little trek. But also, we're going to dig into a little bit about the multiple books. So let me introduce you to David, uh, aka um, ex-divorce lawyer, and now rocking it in the world of health and wellness. David, welcome to Mission Accepted. Oh, uh, Thanks for having me as a guest, Deborah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So look, and I just introduced you as someone who was a divorce lawyer. And you got to tell me, um, so you're a divorce, divorce lawyer that goes into being a multiple author. Share with us a little bit on how that happened and how you I mean, eventually we're going to get to how you're the, you know, you're standing in the pinnacle of where you're standing now. But um, what makes a divorce lawyer want to start writing books about, oh, I don't know, the things that you wrote about, like these historical stories with flair, should I say? Well, the first thing I, I had to do was. Uh, stop practicing law because I was unable to detach from my clients' issues. So their issues became my issues, which caused me to lose sleep, have anxiety, depression. And one of the outlets I had was to write about casino craps, the dice game. And I became a world-class expert at playing uh, casino craps, and I wrote six books on it. From there, that led me to writing a couple novels that involved Las Vegas and playing craps. And that led me um, to my weight loss journey. Wow. Um, I don't think that's probably unusual. I mean, there's many people that are probably listening today that are fairly uh, empathic um, and they're and what they're doing now, um, maybe serving them, not serving them. Um, so to hear you share about how, you know, you were picking up, you know, it was making you not sleep. It was a, dis you know, your work was creating distress in whatever way it was creating distress. We've heard many times people go, you know, I know I need to leave, but, you know, I have a great plan. Um, the compensation's fantastic. 
The benefits are, are incredible for my family. Um, I don't know if there's anything else I can do. Um, so it sounds to me like maybe that, that you had a health crisis and that was the pushing force. Oh, absolutely. Um, what I usually tell people is when we're younger, we'll sacrifice our health in pursuit of wealth. And as we get older, we'll spend our wealth in pursuit of health. And it wasn't so much what parents did to each other or spouses did to each other. I didn't like what they did to the kids. And mm-hmm. that was very upsetting. And I was unable to emotionally, psychologically, and mentally handle it. So it was for my own benefit. Uh, I was told by two psychologists and two neuropsychiatrists, I had to leave the profession. Otherwise I would, you know, be, it'd be detrimental to my health. Wow. I, you know what, I've never heard what you, what you had just said. And I love it because it is true. It's like, we'll give up our health for our wealth. And then as we get older, older, we give up our wealth for our health. I always say to people, I mean, my background has been health and wellness. Um, and I just happened to platform around the entrepreneurship relationship to that. But um, I say to people, this body, this vehicle that you have, this, you know, motor, it is the most important piece of real estate that you own and that you need to invest in that piece of real estate. And because you'll hear people, and I'm sure you've heard it too, like, I can't afford the book. I can't afford the, whether it's a supplement or I can't afford the massage or I can't afford the Cairo or I can't afford the personal trainer. I can't afford that. And I'm like, well, then how do you manage to afford those beautiful pillows on your couch from winners? Or the last time you bought another jacket, which I'm sure you have three of, it's like when you start to realize that you need to invest in yourself. Um, I think I see that happen for people a lot. If they've had a health scare or somewhere around mid forties, they start to get this realization like, Hmm, Hmm. I can't stay up the way I used to, or I, I can't go out and have drinks the way I used to, or I don't feel as good the next day as I used to, or there's some weight around my waist I can't get rid of. Or what about you? How do you feel about that? Like, what do you see? Oh, with people? absolutely. And Starbucks, more people waste money on Starbucks and without realizing it because their drinks are expensive. And some people have two or three a day. And a lot of them will have 50, 60, 70 grams of sugar, which is double to triple of what you actually need. So it, it's, you know, like you said, where do you want to put your priority for spending your money? And Jim Rome had a great quote. He says, if you wear out this body, where else are you going to live? So you need to take care of it. That's a, that's a great, for those of you that like to Instagram and hashtag, that's a, that's a great one, right? Like where else are you going to live? I love it. Yeah. So look, you go ahead, please. I was going to say, I got my wake up call at age 61 in July of 2016 when I went to see my doctor and he told me based on my lab results and I was fat that I had a 95% chance for a fatal heart attack. And he gave me two options, lose the weight or find a new doctor. And he strongly encouraged me to find a new doctor because he had been after me for eight years to lose the weight. And if I did lose weight on a diet, I gained it all back. Sometimes I gained even more. So I was frustrated and embarrassed. This time was different. The light bulb went off. And then during the next four months, I shed 50 pounds, 25% of my total body weight, more importantly, I've kept it off. Okay. So let's take that moment because can't we all relate to the moment that we had a reality check, whether it was in our health, our wealth, our family, our belief systems, our relationships, whatever. But, you know, there's that time where, or, or guys, do you have a friend <laughs> that you're like, you know, if you just, you know, you should change, but you should just and they're like, and, and you're just not, you know, you're just not making their way through it. And then sometimes someone else says something and they change and you're like, huh, but we all hear it when we need to hear it. I guess we all have that place inside where we start to, we can't deny anymore that there's an issue or a problem. So was there something different that day? And, and when you say that, you know, you were overweight, um, was that something that you had always dealt with your whole life? Or was that something that came later on or? And by the way, I know for you that are listening, you can't see what David looks like. But when he said he was 61, I'm like, you must hear it every day, all day. That just, that's not how you present yourself to the world. So you have a very youthful uh, look about you. So what was, like, what was that about? Like, had had it always been that way or just something new? It was, it was new because in my twenties and thirties, I was fit and trim. 
However, like most of us, life gets in the way with family obligations, work responsibilities. And before I realized it, I stopped exercising. I started eating more fast foods, more convenient foods and junk foods. And the weight crept up on me. And it will be, I'll start my diet or eating better on Monday. I'll start after our vacation. I'll start after the holidays. And there's one excuse after another. Nike has their slogan saying, just do it. And I say they got it wrong. It should be just do it now. Mm. Because if we put off till tomorrow, what we can do today and tomorrow never comes, we just never do what we need to get done. Okay, so I can hear the audience out here. That's the that's the gift of being the, you know, the interviewer is that I hear these questions like, okay, so you had your pinnacle moment. Um, we all have. Um, you say you've kept it off. So they're like, oh, what did you do? I mean, here's someone, you mean, you know, obviously you you were you were obviously a great lawyer. You cared so much. And then you went into authoring and you authored like six books. Like, you know, you go into studying the world of craps, you you write some fiction and nonfiction books. Next thing you know, you have this personal health crisis. And now you're a catalyst for many people and your book is exponential and you're on your fourth book. So how did you do that? What did you do? How did you know what to do? And, and how can you be able to keep it off, David? That's incredible. Well, I learned to keep it off because I went back to my books from the 1970s by Paul and Patricia Bragg, Jack LaLanne, Richard Simmons, and William Duff, these sugar blues. And I was reading those and I realized they were talking about basic principles, things we all know what to do. We just don't do it, especially when it comes to eating healthy. Then I was reading books from current authors and I realized they were promoting their products, their programs, their services. And it made it feel like if you didn't invest in their product or services or programs, you would fail. And I thought there's something wrong there. When I started my weight loss journey, the weight loss industry was a $61 billion a year industry. Today, it's $72 billion a year industry. So things are going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. People are getting heavier and heavier. They're spending more money on prescription drugs. And it's really simple things. I've identified what I call the nine golden rules of weight loss. And when people hear them, they're like, well, I know that. I understand you know that. The question is, are you doing it? And for most people, they're only doing a few or none at all. And then the question is, well, if you know what to do, why aren't you doing it? And that's where I help people get to the underlying issues. Okay. So that's, I mean, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I think we all can say that we know what to do, but, and I think the reason why that's a, that's a very large number that you put out there in terms of, you know, this industry and the numbers and going in the wrong direction. And I think you got to the heart of it. It's like, whether it's the gym or what have you, it's why aren't we? So can you share with us some of that? Is, is that what's in your book as well? Like talking oh, sure. about how, you know, how do you dig in a little bit? So maybe talk to that a bit. Cause I mean, we're all on the edge of our seat here. It's a obviously big billion dollar industry. We've all had our, whatever we think about in terms of, you know, we, we need to gain weight. We need to lose weight. We need to look a different shape. We need to this. And you know, the, the magazines and the this and all of that has helped carve whatever it is out. And it's interesting. I was sharing with this someone the other day and I said, you know, I happen to live in North America and in North America, there there's a culture around how people should look, which is complete opposite, complete opposite to my girlfriend who lives in another part of the world, a completely different continent, where one of the issues in that continent is that people are buying, I think it's chicken hormones um, on the black market so that it makes them get bigger, right? And so in the culture that I am, it's not bigger, it's fit and tiny. Where she is, it's the bigger the boot the you know, the better it is and the more sexy you are. And women are actually downloading on these chicken hormones to make themselves bigger. Very interesting. I don't know why I brought that up, but um, so what's going on underneath that you that you help people with? Well, the first golden rule is to drink more water. And the reason I say that is 75% of the U.S. population is chronically dehydrated because our bodies mm. are 60 to 70% water, not soda, diet soda, fruit juice, milk, or flavored waters. It is 
pure water. And there's a direct correlation to people being overweight because 72% of the U.S. adult population is overweight. A lot of times what happens, we think we're hungry, we're actually thirsty. So that's the first thing is drink more water. And I, I'm laughing to myself when I hear these commercials for Wegovi and Ozempic because they're appetite suppressants and they're very expensive. And water is a natural appetite suppressant. So if you drink more water, you stay hydrated and you'll feel fuller and you'll eat less. The second golden rule is to avoid the highly processed and manufactured foods. So put down the Doritos, the Cheetos, the Pringles potato chips, and all the other snacks out there, the deli meats, they're all highly toxic to your body. And although you don't realize it's poisonous to you because you don't feel it right away, it accumulates. And after 20, 30, 40 years, that's where the negative consequences start to show because of the compounding effect they have in accumulating your body. And the third golden rule is to eat holistic, real foods, preferably organic. However, if you're unable to get organic food, then, you know, eat the real apple, the real banana, the real pear, not the imitation stuff. The fourth golden rule is to eat slower because we're all in a hurry. So a lot of times mm -hmm. we do what I call mindless eating, where you'll put down your sandwich or you'll put down the, you know, you look in the bowl and the bowl of snacks is empty. The sandwich is gone. It's like, where did it go? Well, you ate it without realizing it, which then goes into the next golden rule. Number five of eats uh, small portions. Our portion sizes have been supersized without us realizing it. In the 1900s, the average size dinner plate was nine inches in diameter. Today in the US, it's 12 inches in diameter, except in uh, Europe, it's still nine inches, except for the UK. In restaurants, the average service, you know, serving plate is 13 to 15 inches. So what I tell people is cut the meal in half, get a to-go box right away, put half to go, eat the rest, you know, so you eat a smaller portion and you get two meals for the price of one, it's saving a lot of money for you. The next golden rule, number six, is to rest to digest. And that means give your body adequate time to process and digest the food. And usually I tell people, if you go 12 hours as a minimum, you'll be fine. Some experts will say an intermittent fast is 12 hours. Some will say 14, some 16, some 18. Again, you ask one expert one thing, you'll get one answer. You'll ask a second expert another, he'll give you a different answer. You'll ask a third expert and he'll tell you the first two are both wrong. So <laughs> you have to figure out what's going to be best for your own body because we're all different. We're all unique and individuals. Uh, the way I look at it is if you stop eating three hours before you go to sleep and you get seven to eight hours of quality sleep and the first thing you do in the morning is drink an eight ounce or more glass of water to hydrate and your first meal, which is breakfast to break the fast, about two hours later, that's 12 hours or more. And then that goes to go to rule number seven, which is to get adequate sleep. Most of us are sleep deprived. And what research shows is if you're sleep deprived, you'll consume an extra 500 calories the next day. Now the daily nutritional values are based on 2000 calories per day. However, most people only need between 1250 and 1750 calories, unless you're a pregnant female or unless you are physically active or exercise a lot then you need more calories. Research shows that the average American will consume 3,600 calories per day, almost double what we need and almost double what's based on the uh, nutritional daily panels. And the next uh, golden rule number eight is to think positive. It's been shown that 80% of our thoughts are negative each day. Imagine if we turned it around made 80% positive. And the last one is to walk each day. And the reason I say walk is because it should be physical activity. However, walking is the easiest physical activity anybody can do. It's free. And as long as you're upright and able to move forward, you can do it. Rebel Wilson lost 77 pounds in a year, walking an hour each day. Now I realize not everybody has an hour to walk each day. However, Mindy Kalis lost weight. And what she would do when she had a break Instead of texting or doing social media for 10 or 15 minutes, she would go for a 10 or 15 minute walk. 
Well, if you do that four or five times throughout the day, that's an hour and breaks it up. So you don't have to do everything at one time. Usually by the time people will drive to the gym, do their exercise and then drive back, I've already completed a short you know, physical workout uh, without going to the gym. And that brings me to one of the myths that you have to exercise to lose weight. 90% of weight issues is based on what we put into our body. Don't get me wrong, Deborah. Physical activity is extremely important for overall health and fitness. However, when it comes to weight loss, that's not going to happen. It will help a little bit. 66% of the contestants on The Biggest Loser have regained all their weight. Some have gained more. And the majority of them have gained a lot of the weight back because it's impossible, maybe not impossible, very difficult to exercise as many hours as they were doing and eat as healthy as they were when they're at home taking care of their spouses, their kids, and then have their work obligations. A lot of exterior environmental factors that go into that. The other thing is they show that fat and muscle weigh the exact same amount. Five pounds is five pounds. So five pounds of fat is the same as five pounds of muscle. The difference is five pounds of muscle takes up a lot less room than fat because it's denser. So mm -hmm. what happens is people make their news resolution. They go to the gym, they're exercising, they're eating healthy, and they get on a scale three weeks later and the scale hasn't moved. And now they're frustrated because they're doing everything right. Well, what's happening is they're replacing the fat with muscle. So I had a client that actually happened to, after three weeks, I said to him, well, are you exercising more? He goes, yeah, I'm walking five miles a day, riding my bike. And I said, how do your clothes feel? Oh, they're loose. In fact, people are asking me if I'm losing weight. He says, the scale doesn't show. I said, don't go by the scale. Go by how your clothes feel, how your energy level feels, your mental clarity, because all that will improve as you're, you know, reducing the weight, eating healthier and doing the physical activity. Wow. And so I have to say when this doctor had, thank you for that. That was, you know, not only is it refreshing, it's a great reminder. And I think when you look at all those components, like you said, it's easy to do, but here's why I think a no, lot of people- it's, it's simple to do, not easy. Simple to do, not easy. Okay. So it's simple to do, but when you give the information in the way that you do, like when you give information with backup support, it's easier to digest, excuse the term. It's easier to digest and you want to drink more. I mean, this is the first time that I've heard, and I know when you drink, you feel full, but when you put it into the context of, you know, to have something to drink, to be continually giving your body fluid is actually can curb those cravings because your body's not hungry, it's thirsty. I've heard, you know, many different, it said many different ways, but that's just so easy to digest. And when I think when you get the understanding behind what it is you should do, it makes it easier to do because there's logic that kicks in. It makes sense. It's, it's rational. Um, but when you go back to that time where your doctor was like, you need to lose this and you started researching. So all of a sudden you became willing, I guess, or more open. How did you go from there? And I know that you've done some pretty, some pretty great things now that you've got your body into a different state of health. So please share this little trek that you went on. But then what made you decide, I got to share this with people, like make books. And I think you do a program and tell us what you do now. Um, I mean, this, this was really a big catalyst for your career as well. Yeah. Like I said, it was my wake up call. I had a why I didn't want to die. It was really simple. I, I wanted to do a lot more. Uh, the trek I did was I hiked up Mount Kilimanjaro last <laughs> June in 2022 at age 67. So when people tell me that they're too old to do certain things, I'd look at them and say, no, you're not, because I'm exhibit A. If I'm able to do it, you're able to do it. The body has tremendous ability to repair the damage that's been done. 80% uh, of people, well, let me rephrase that. People who are age 50 or older, 80% of them are either a type two diabetic or pre-diabetic. And if you're a pre-diabetic, what it means is in seven years, if you don't change your eating habits, you'll be a, a full-blown type two diabetic. Type two diabetes is preventable and it's also reversible. 
Some experts will argue it's not reversible. However, it will go into a dormant or latent state. It doesn't matter to me as long as it's not showing the symptoms and you're not exhibiting the issues with it. So imagine that you can improve your overall health simply by changing what you put into your mouth, changing your diet. And there's a big distinction between being on a diet, which is, you know, uh, willfully limiting your amount of nutritional food that you're taking and the diet that you eat, which is your dietary intake. So a lot of people get confused with that. And one of the biggest things out there is the Mediterranean diet is the best diet in the world because that's the type of food that you eat as a lifestyle. It's not a temporary diet such as Jenny Craig or Nutrisystem, unless you want to be on those products the rest of your life. And who wants to do that? I mean, a lot of it's all chemicals too. Yeah. So look, not everybody understands what the Mediterranean diet is. So please, for those that are listening that are, are like, what is that? What is the Mediterranean diet? They've never even been there. What, what does that consist of? It consists of eating a lot of healthy fats, such as olive oil, uh, raw, unsalted nuts, um, a lot of fish, a lot of uh, fresh vegetables and fruits, mostly vegetables, mm -hmm. and uh, water, and a glass of wine with meal. So it's a glass of red wine usually, uh, and it's one or two glasses. It's not a whole bottle. So it's just, again, it's a lifestyle. Dan Buettner wrote the book, The Blue Zones, and they've identified five areas around the world where people have healthy, long lives of, you know, high 90s years of age or over 100 that are physically active and mentally alert and sharp, have all their cognitive ability, and they have a lot of uh, similarities. It's not just what they eat. It's the community that it's socializing. It's eating slow, physical activity. So again, it's not just the food you put in your mouth. It's an entire lifestyle, uh, relaxing, keeping alert. In Japan, they have a term called ikigai, and that means life purpose. And they don't have a word for retirement in Japan, in Okinawa. So people never retire. They just have hobbies and a life purpose or a mission that they want to do. And that keeps them you know, energetic and youthful. Thank you for that. Talk to us a little bit about the decision to do this track and what was that like for you? I met Blair Singer, uh, who I was a staff member at one of his events and he would take people up every year in July before COVID uh, for trips up to Mount Kilimanjaro. And I, I saw that, I said, oh, that looks like it'd be fun to do. So I thought, why well, I, I should do it. And then I met Ann Lori Moore and she set the world record for the oldest person at age 89 to successfully, you know, make it to the summit of Kilimanjaro. So I told her, I said, well, I'm going to beat your record and do it at age 90. And she goes, good luck. <laughs> so I figured, well, I better start to see what I'm getting myself into. If that's one of my goals is to hike it and set the world record at age 90. My wife may have something to say about that. She's not real thrilled <laughs> that you know, I want to go back and do it again. So, Wow, that's incredible. Um, you inspire me, my friend. I'm going to be doing this trek across Ireland, you know, raising money for the music industry. And we'll be doing eight and a half marathons in eight days. But um, I, I think you got me there. I think you got me there because, you know, I'm only going to be 59. And so, you know, you're, <laughs> you're always going to be ahead of me in that. Um so let's talk a little bit. What is the name of your book? I mean, people are going to like, how can I talk to you? What's on your website that people can find? What kind of resources do you have for people? Sure. Um, my goal right now is to help 5,000 people before 2030 uh, who are jaded by diets, weight loss programs and products to reduce weight and keep it off so they can be healthier and live a more fuller energetic life. And the name of my book is the fourth one is stop dieting, start thinning. And right. it's endorsed and recommended by Hal Elrod who wrote the miracle morning. And then my third book is called break the chains of dieting. And that is actually endorsed and recommended by Jack Canfield co-author co of chicken soup for the soul. Okay. So I feel very honored that these individuals have taken time to read the book and to, um, as I put it, give their blessing. Amazing. And so 
when you talk about, um, and I know that we're kind of coming up to time and people can reach you and, and dig a little deeper. I mean, this is about digging deeper. You obviously have, um, you know, tra trailed the, the entrepreneurial world in terms of books and information and sharing. And I think you've tapped into something that's pretty grand and, you know, pretty important. So people can dig in a little deeper, but in your experience so far, what is maybe one reason why people hear this information and don't pick up the phone? What is the one reason why people don't go get the book? What is the one reason that stops people from drinking more water? Like what's going on like underneath? Well, the first thing when you want to change a habit or routine is to be aware of what you need to change. So a lot of people aren't aware they're not drinking enough water. They mm. may think they are. Uh, the second thing is people aren't, motivated enough they don't have a big enough why i mm -hmm. met an individual a couple of weeks ago who needs to reduce weight and i said well i'm going to help you you know what's preventing you from starting and he says i'm not sure he says i had a stroke a year ago i said you had a stroke and he's at least 10 years younger than i am i said and that didn't motivate you and he said no and i said what will he goes i don't know so again a lot of people there's nothing that will motivate them because they do not want to give up their McDonald's or Starbucks, their, you know, Doritos, their diet, Pepsi, their diet Cokes their sodas. Uh, they're just not willing to do it. They rather suffer the consequences. Uh, what I usually tell people is everybody wants to be healthy and fit until they learn what they need to do. And then it changes their attitude because they don't want to put the effort and yeah. do everything yeah. that they need to do. And again, it's simple. When I tell people the nine things, I ask them, is there anything in there that you're unable to do? And they're like, well, no. And the question is, why aren't you doing it then? And it, it comes down to motivation. What will motivate? And if you're not going to do it for your kids or for your spouse or yourself, uh, maybe you're a business owner. Think about your employees. What would happen if something catastrophic happened, happened to you because of health issues? Uh, what would happen to your employees? What would happen to your uh, business colleagues and associates, something happened to you. So a lot of people may not do it for themselves. They'll do it for other people. Mm -hmm. And then somehow they find the reason to, or it comes to them or they start to feel better and they start to have belief in themselves. And honestly, I mean, I'm a huge advocate. I'm a coach. You're a coach. We train people. We get behind people. We hold the pillar up until um, they're able to do that for themselves so, and I think that's important. You know what? I think that's important that positive reinforcement, that conversation relationship with someone like yourself, just knowing that you have someone on your team that you can talk to, like, I'm going through a lot of stress at work, or this is changing, or there's things going on in my marriage. And that bag of Doritos is calling my friggin' name. You know what I mean? Like that bet, you know, it's like telling people don't go down that aisle in the grocery store. Just don't go down when you're under duress. Like, those kind of things that you can give people on that one-on-one -on -one because everyone's got their triggers, right? Yeah. For me, look, I got sick in my 20s. I was told I was allergic to sugar. I haven't had it for 30 years. I can walk by sugar all day. I can see a big chocolate bar. I feel like I'm walking by a vase of flowers. It doesn't, it doesn't even register with me. For some people, that would be insane. What do you mean you're walking by Hershey's Kisses? I can't, you know. But uh, don't put a bag of potato chips in my house because I can't have one potato chip, right? Well, so no, I that, that's true. And, and I'm like you. In fact, talking about potato chips, when they say, bet you can't eat just one, that's not a dare. It's a fact because they've scientifically engineered our food to optimize our cravings for fat, salt, texture. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. other thing is, uh, I haven't had a Hershey's bar since 2016. I used to love Hershey bars. I haven't had m and M since 2016. I haven't had any soda since then. Uh, Pringles potato chips because I was addicted to it. And I treated it like alcoholism. Mm -hmm. you, know, you cannot offer an alcoholic one drink and expect him to stop. And I'm like that with certain foods. So I just don't even think. And now I don't even think about it anymore. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what I mean about having someone behind you that can really kind of hold tight to that. Um, you have picked a very interesting sector to be in my friend. And uh, obviously we're very grateful. And so are many people. 
Uh, so I'm just going to, I have one question that I want to ask, but I want you to tell people where they can reach you and how they can reach you. But before we do that, because you've accomplished many things um, and I want to ask you, what is, what is left on your bucket list? Other than, you know, doing the 90 year old walk outside of that, is there anything on your bucket list? Yes. My goal is to live to be over 120 physically fit, mentally alert with great cognitive ability. Uh, so that that's my goal. Um, as far as bucket list, my wife and I are going to Pompeii in a couple of weeks. So that's one of them. Um, we've done a lot of things. We have a lot of things we want to do. We want to do Machu Picchu. Uh, so there's a lot of things. I just am grateful and blessed each day I wake up that I'm healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Touche. Touche. Um, okay. So please tell people where they can reach you. And then I have a, I have a final question for us today. Sure. They can reach me at uh, www.i, the letter M as in Mary, thinning, T-H-I-N-N-I-N-G.com. So it's I am thinning.com. They can also reach me on Facebook and they can join the free Facebook group that I've created. It's called Live Your Um, like I am, except it's Um, Thinning Life. And in there, I put up a lot of great information, articles that I read, because every day I go through four or five articles. Some have great information. Some are just pure garbage. And as yeah. a lawyer, I've learned to sift through the fact, the opinion, and the fiction. And so I put up the what I figure are trustworthy, reliable, and truthful articles about health and fitness. So, And it's all free. And I don't allow any promotion for products or, or programs, not even my own. It's there for just people to learn and get information. It's also for support. Like you said, people need support and to mm -hmm. be accountable. The book, uh, Stop Dieting, Start Thinning, has a chapter on how you can get an accountability partner. And it's not only what to do with an accountability partner, it's how to handle an accountability phone call and the questions to ask and how to conduct it. So there's a lot of great information. The book I made, the Stop Diet and Start Thinning in such a way that it wasn't just what to do, like a lot of books out there. It's mm -hmm. also how to do it. So it gives you specific ideas, suggestions, and tips. I'm a big proponent of that. You know, everyone's going to know, oh, you just said Deb's magic word. It's not what to do. It's how to do it. That's what my all my training is about because we get told what to do all the time. And, you know, and funny, my son just told me, I said, I said something to my son and he goes, you know, when you tell me what to do, I don't want to do it. Right. I'm like, I'm so glad, I'm so glad you're self-observant of yourself, Ocean, that you feel like you could share that information with me and it's going to land well. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> all right. I'm like, well, okay, so I'm just going to tell you how you need exactly, to do Exactly. For example, I, I just gave the nine golden rules. I just told everybody what to do. Yeah. I didn't tell you how to drink more water, how to slow down. I give you the suggestions, the tips, yeah. the ideas. I'm happy to do that. I do put those up in the Facebook group, yeah. the Live Your I'm Thinning Life group. And again, it's free to join. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm a big, that's a big proponent for me. Okay, so look at, you know where to reach David and you guys are hooked in. I know that you know all of the dates that we're doing for the summits. It's on the eighth day of every month, no matter what day it falls on from now till International Women's Day 2024. So just remember eight. And then, of course, we've got more going on from there. But let's just get you through 2023, shall we? Into 2024. You can find him and put a question in there in the chat anywhere for him. You'll see me mention his name a number of times. He's a sponsor. And so you can actually have a conversation with him in there as well. If you're like, what? Or PM me and I'll connect you. That's how it happens. That's how it works. Yeah. If Deborah, you want to be, sorry. Just one last thing. Yeah. In case people are unaware how to spell my last name. Yeah. It's Medansky. It's M-E. So it's M is a Mary, E is an Edward. D-A-N, Dan, uh, S-K-Y. So like three words, me, Dan, and Sky. Okay. Oh, perfect. Me, Dan, and Sky. And it's going to be all in the show notes as well, every way and every how to access um, him. So that's fantastic. So my final question for you is this. Um, we're talking about health and fitness. We've talked about the Ireland trek. We know my love for music. I believe that music is one of the most powerful healers. It's 
good for our body, good for our mind, good for our soul. So as you're doing what David's telling you to do, you got to be listening to music. But look, I want to know you. So um, you're on your way to a desert island and gosh, God knows it sounds like you are. But uh, so you're doing this this trip and you're packing your suitcase and you only have room for one album. And this is the desert island that, you know, you're only getting one album. What is the album that you would take that you could not imagine never listening to again? Fleetwood Mac. All right. Dance. All right. <laughs> Rumors, I'm assuming. No, um, it, the dance. That's what they won their Grammy for. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, okay. Rumors was the second. Yeah. Yeah. No, just when you say Fleetwood Mac, I just automatically go to Rumors, right? So um, Fleetwood Mac, fantastic um okay so we're going to sign off here and is there any final words that you want to say to our audience we say good day i always give these final words drink more water <laughs> all right drink more water you heard it here didn't hear it first you heard it from david drink more water you guys are amazing we're so grateful for you as an audience please share these just share these tips and share this podcast you know where to access it it's at debdrummond.com you can go anywhere go into google and you will see all the places that we play at if you want to be sitting where david is reach out if you've got something to say if you've got something to share if and if you're on a mission and you think people should know about it well you know this is not difficult to reach deb at debdrummond.com love to have a conversation with you and until we see you again this week be well and stay groovy thanks bye for now